welcome to the Mind Money Spectrum podcast, where your hosts, Aaron Ogti and Trisha Patel, go beyond traditional finance questions to help you explore how to use your money to achieve the freedom you want in life. When everything shut down in March due to the COVID-19 pandemic, most people were able to hunker down to get through an acutely stressful period. But as this pandemic became an ongoing chronic concern, we now understand that new coping mechanisms are essential. To move forward, it may help to reflect on the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. In this episode, Trisha and Aaron discuss how their feelings have changed over the last few months and some of the ways they are trying to keep at it one day at a time. And now, on to our conversation. Hi, my name is Aaron Ogti. I'm a financial advisor in the Bay Area, and I'm here with Trisha Patel, a wealth manager on the East Coast. Hey, Aaron. Great to be here today, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Great to be here as well. A few weeks ago, Trish and I were discussing just how we felt as parents during COVID and especially how we felt with school decisions coming up and the risks of sending them back to group gatherings indoors compared to the risks, especially psychological, of them staying at home and the impact on both their psyche and hours as parents. And Trisha made the comment that, yeah, this could go on for another year or two. I remember I, I, I almost broke down in that moment, just the idea of considering it, yes, that's a distinct possibility. And so I've been thinking, and we've been talking about this idea of back in March and April, when everything started shutting down, we started to understand what the scope of this was. There was this sense that it was temporary, that we just had to get through this and hunker down to get to a stage where it was going to be okay. And now we need to understand that it may not be temporary, or at least temporary in the way our brains think. So today we're talking about this idea of some of the coping mechanisms and how the brain and psychology work with temporary disasters versus chronic issues. So, Trishel, when when you first consider this idea that it could be another year and how long you would have to kind of live the lifestyle now and adapting, how did you first feel about that? And what were some of your first initial thoughts considering the idea that this could be going on for a while? It's interesting the pattern that I've kind of noticed with myself, and it might even relate more generally to what I've seen with those around me. And this kind of ties back to this article I read recently, in fact, that ties the relationship that people have to COVID with the five stages of grief when they lose somebody important to them. And just very quickly, those five stages are, it kind of begins with this notion of denial. And then eventually people may move on to this notion of anger. And then after that, people may start this notion of bargaining. And then there comes depression. And then finally, acceptance. And frankly, I'm not too sure about the, the signs behind all of this, but it feels like this type of progression has been going on with myself. And again, I've kind of noticed this with other people around me. So in the beginning, it was, I think, quite related to this notion of denial, (laughs) where (laughs) here we are with a pandemic, and there's been some understanding that pandemics don't disappear completely sometimes. But there was evidence that suggests that based upon past pandemics or near pandemics, that things could actually be contained and get better. So maybe there was a a good amount of hope at that point as well. However, what kind of got me thinking in the direction that this may be 
not so immediate in terms of the recovery from all this was this article I, I read back in, it was actually in March of this year. And the title of the article from the MIT Technology Review was, we're not going back to normal. And of course, there, there was a lot of information coming out at breakneck pace around this time of all sorts of things of it being the end of civilization to this is going to be something that we'll deal with for a few weeks and kind of get back to normal. But what caught my eye in this article was it had some research put forward by a group of individuals from the Imperial College of London. And what they did is they studied and simulated what happens in situations like this where you have a pandemic that kind of spreads. And what happens if you layer in social distancing and other techniques to kind of calm the spread into the mix. And the end result was this graph that they put out which showed this kind of sign pattern where it expected cases to spike and then social distancing and other measures would be implemented and then cases and deaths would come down and then things would get better and the community would open again and then cases would spike and then it would go down again and the graph showed this simulation going out to 2021 November and <laughs> in my mind it, that was probably the first time where I guess just mentally I got the whiff that this could potentially stick around for quite some time. And I, I went ahead and I forwarded the article to a few people just to kind of gauge their impression. I wrote a blog post about it in April where I highlighted kind of what my thoughts about what was going on with the pandemic and I did include this article. But I still think around that time, I had this kind of sense of false hope, even in, into March and April that, you know, we just kind of need to hunker down and get rid of this first hump and maybe things will just kind of dissipate on their own and we might get back to normal or very close to normal after six to eight weeks. Yeah, I, I had similar feeling like that, that difference between I acknowledged it was a possibility. So I was also relating to Monte Carlo simulations that, yeah, that was in the range of possible. I didn't think six to eight weeks was going to happen. I didn't think two years was going to happen, but those were the, the range of possibilities. I thought it was going to be on the scale of three to four months that with enough procedures put in place, enough kind of public health policy that by the kind of when schools coming back around, that we'd, be, we'd have something pretty good and at least an idea that it might be okay or how, how we can deal with this. But it was as the lack of public health policy came out or other, unfortunately, political issues that I don't know if I want to get into today, but I started to realize that, well, now that the most likely thing to happen isn't the three to four months, the most likely thing is probably into 2021. And my, my, my hopes started to shift from, I hope the kids get to go back to school to, I hope I get to go skiing in January. And that's still five months away. We're recording this in August. And that was the stage where I started to realize, you know, man, I, I can't keep going the same way I was in March, April, May, even a little bit into June, that we really need to figure out, okay, how are we going to live our desired lifestyle for at least another half the year, probably on a scale of five to six months. And it made me think about a lot of the questions that I ask clients. We've talked about George Kinder's three questions and life planning and this idea of just if you can remove money from your way of thinking, then how do you choose to spend your time to live the lifestyle that you want? So it's a lot of the things that, that I had in my lifestyle were, were gone. I couldn't do that. Uh, I, another advisor 
uh, wrote an article kind of how do you thrive in the time of COVID? Because going back to the first few months, it really just felt like it was just getting by. And when I th thought about that question, I, I honestly couldn't come up with an answer. How, how do I change my, my personal life plan to do the things I enjoy when I can't go play team sports and I definitely can't go to, to sporting events, but even going out to see friends and family was kind of off the table. And it was, it was like you said that, that I still hope that it's not going to last that long. And, but it was that, that transition from, it was definitely on the range of possibilities, but I didn't think it was going to be that long. I thought the most likely thing was just a few months. And now I think the likely thing is much, much longer. So I, I have felt that my personal expectation, which also kind of implies that the outer range now could be even longer than two years. And I, I don't know that I can keep this like hunkered down mentality for that long, I need to kind of figure out what's, what's my new day to day. What are my new projects, new goals? How do I live the lifestyle I want given these new restrictions? So what are some of the things that you have noticed about yourself in terms of your feelings or thinking and how they, how they have transitioned a little bit? Well, just adding to what I mentioned before with those, five stages of grief. I think I, again, was in the denial stage for a good amount of time. The, let's just think about the present and future will kind of figure itself out in a way that I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> but I think maybe after that, I, I did get a bit angry in terms of, you know, why isn't this resolving yourself or why are we aren't we taking X measure or Y measure or why is that country over there doing a better job than this country over mm -hmm. here? And there's clearly things we can do, but we're not and so on. So I, I think there was a good amount of that, you know, frankly, that ended up bubbling through my mind. I'm not sure I did the next stage, which is bargaining, but part of it is kind of thinking what makes the most sense based upon the situation we're in and I guess it's just part of my personality to not do the if onlys because in this situation it's hard to say what an individual could have done differently yeah no I, I do understand that if I had a, a parallel situation where somebody I knew very close, either myself or my immediate family came in contact with COVID and contracted it and had serious ramifications for that. Obviously that's happened to millions and millions of people in the in this country. Then I think bargaining might be a big part of it. The notion that what if I didn't go to that grocery store or what if I washed my hands three times instead of two? And, and I'm sure that that's a big part of someone's mindset if they've actually been directly impacted by by this pandemic from the point of actually being in in close proximity to if not having had the disease itself that's a good point i i i definitely have been fortunate enough that i have not been exposed to anyone who's had it i do know some people who have had it and but i've only interacted with them virtually. So I, from that perspective, uh, I have been lucky enough to just haven't put myself or family at risk. That's not to say it doesn't. I, I, I am trying to do things that I enjoy and trying to do them as safely as possible. But I, I know my family is not just staying inside 100% of the time. So we think about kind of what are acceptable risks. When I think about the anger I've definitely felt, when I think about the five stages, again, it's like, like you said, it's mostly directed toward politics and public policy. The anger I feel towards 
anti-maskers is the same I feel towards anti-vaxxers. The bargaining, it does feel like I'm still at that stage of like, I really hope I get to go skiing. And it's it just, I'm just using that as a proxy for get to do a fun activity outside that I, is part of my normal like seasonality of the year to year. I, I got to do some skiing this past winter. I'd like to do some skiing this, this next winter. And I, that, that, as you describe the five stages of grief, that feels like the closest thing I'm to that bargaining stage of like, so I think I'll be okay as long as I have that to look forward to. But I, it's possible that doesn't happen. It's possible that it's just not safe. And, or it's possible that it's, they open, but it's too risky and I, I don't get to do that. So but that, that might be the stage where I get depressed. But yeah, it's, I, I think that, I think that would probably be my, my, my bargaining stage now that I can, I can do this as long as I get that, that particular thing. And that, that, that's not necessarily the, the best coping mechanism. Because I, I do think we need, I, at least I need to figure out, okay, if that doesn't happen, how do I still kind of make sure I'm as close to happy as I can? Like, I think what, what are some of the decisions I can make now with my own happiness in mind, given these restrictions? Because it can't, I, it can't attach my happiness to skiing. It, it's, I can't attach my ha happiness to this unknown thing that may or may not happen. But trying to find more pleasure in the day to day. I think that's one of the things that, and I think I have some things, but I haven't quite figured that out for myself yet. Yeah. I think it's kind of part of the journey and I, I don't know if this is even true or not, but what I've briefly heard about these five stages of grief is you kind of have to go through them and you can't kind of force yourself through them. Like you can't shortcut it. You have to kind of just experience it and take it in and let time also pass. So that might be how it is with these stages as it relates to the pandemic and the individual. You know, some people may go zip through and go all the way to acceptance pretty quickly, but for other people, they actually need to take their time and ruminate and and dwell and and have grief that it's just a process <laughs> and i i think for myself part of it was also understanding that there's a only so much things you can do given the constraints but b at the end of the day if you know, I myself am, am in a healthy state and my family are, there are potentially, you know, limitless possibilities in theory of things that we could do still within the realm of all these constraints. And hopefully that, that's where my thinking leads to the options that we might consider from here. That's a good point. I, I, I do, you're right, there, there are, there's definitely things that I, I could do that I'm just not at this stage. I remember when the girls were in school uh, on usually Tuesdays and one other day a week, I would drop them off or pick them up. And school's right about a mile away. So I would try to make sure we walked there at least once a week and then walk home another day per week. And I would actually run to the school. When I'm picking them up, I'd run to the school and then walk home with them. On the drop-offs, I would walk to the school with them and then run home. And so I was getting kind of a, a decent quick run just for some exercise twice a week. And I haven't done that. Definitely haven't done that because we haven't gone to school, but I haven't replaced that with another good run. And I'll have to think about how I could do that because in part because the kids are here and they usually need help with school related things and my wife and I are both trying to work, so we're, we're tag-teaming parenting and schooling with them. 
but that is the kind of thing where, you know what, I probably could get a little more creative. If that's a priority in my life, then I should figure out how to schedule that. And maybe it's not a priority in my life. I need to kind of be a little more introspective, but that is probably something I could do without it necessarily being risky. All right. Yeah, like speaking of the next stage, depression, I, I just read recently that aerobic exercise decreased symptoms of major depression by over half. So it's just one of those things where kind of feel stuck or trapped. It, it might be a good thing to consider. Yeah. I was also thinking about the another article I read um, by Tara Hale. I don't know if I'm going to mispronounce her last name. It's H-A-E-L-L-E. She wrote it for Medium. And it was addressing a lot of the things we've been talking about. The, the idea that we were getting through early on, but it took a while until we started to feel worse. And she goes into the brain physiology and some of the psychology. And one of the things she talks about is surge capacity and usually has it relates to kind of natural disasters. It, it's a little bit like the flight or fight response, fight or flight, but that tends to be more immediate. And the idea of surge capacity is kind of focused on short-term survival in acutely stressful situations, such as natural disasters, where it's not immediate split second, it's more over the span of days or weeks, but kind of it's still a short period. And the pandemic has produced a lot of those same kind of natural disaster responses, especially in our brain, but it's no longer temporary. It's no longer acute. It's now chronic. And our brains have kind of used up our capacity to adjust and cope and get through. And that's kind of why a lot of stress and anxiety have increased, especially after the, after the first couple months. And it, it really did hit home about this idea that it lined up with that transition that, okay, I, I am confident I can hunker down and get through this. And I keep kind of using that, that phrase, but that, that's the best example of just don't have to take any extra risks, don't have to do anything that's unnecessary. I can give up the things I enjoy for, for a temporary period to be safe. But now it's, I, I, I I can feel that I can't continue on that way. And so it, it was a really helpful article, but did you have any kind of quick thoughts on that idea of just how your brain reacted to acute versus chronic issues? What it highlighted for me is that it might come down to the individual and their circumstance. And I think, uh, as I mentioned, I feel kind of fortunate that I've not been directly impacted. We've had definitely some close calls and definitely some situations where not immediate family, but extended family has the disease. And I think for myself, I've been able to come to a point where I, I guess you might call it acceptance, you know, that, that fifth stage, but mm -hmm. it more relates to the notion that here we are, let's come up with a longer term plan and let's see what options we can do to, to make, kind of make the most of it. And I realize that's kind of been easier for me personally to say, just because I have a few options that have made the situation certainly more bearable. I've been able to maintain my business and grow my business. And my wife and I both work from home. We keep ourselves busy without having to actually be mixed with the community by choice. That's just 
something we've had in place before the pandemic started. And we're fortunate to have family nearby to help take care of my daughter. Now we do have that tough decision about school coming up and what we continue to make our best efforts to put our best thinking forward for that. We continue to weigh the information in front of us and do our best to move forward with that. Given all this, I still realize, again, we, we tend to be, what well, I, I consider myself fortunate in how this has played out in terms of how it could have been having a, you know, just a different hat on. And what it reminds me of is the fact that, for example, a stress, long-term stress is something that I guess we in this country I don't know if we thrive on it, but it, it, maybe it's a staple of our diet. And perhaps it's because of that, that maybe we, we have a, a stronger capacity, but maybe we're, we're at the breaking point as well. It, it's hard to say. One thing that kind of reached up into my mind is I, I recall that we've discussed the, the Global Happiness Index some time mm -hmm. ago. Well, uh, Gallup, of Gallup polls uh, that you probably have heard about near, here and there on, on the news, they actually conduct a survey across the globe of stress levels. And the U.S., it, as we might expect, is one of the more stressful countries, far above the average. So on average, global stress is about 35%, meaning 35% of individuals express stress in their lives on an ongoing basis, or you know, when that poll was taken, 35% mm -hmm. of individuals were stressed out. But in the US, it's well above 50%, 55%. And there are other countries who have this level of stress, but they, they have wars and stuff going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the, you know, this was in 2019, based upon 2018 data when Obviously, things were a lot more glowy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I imagine if that same survey were to come out next year or about this year, we kind of see a, a quite different picture. Yeah. I, I, I am really curious. It's, it's one of those things where by the time we get the 2020 data and it's 2021, I hope we don't need that data anymore, <laughs> but maybe, maybe we do. The other thing I liked about the the article that that I mentioned was that it did provide. It, it's just that there's not a handbook for dealing with this, but there are some kind of points of wisdom, and I like those. And I, I don't know how if I can apply them all to myself, but the first one really did relate to what you talked about was just acceptance that like, accepting that life is different right now. And maybe you do have to go through those five stages of grief. And I, I thought I read somewhere that they're not necessarily consecutive, but if you can get to the point where accept that life is different now, then that that might be just be the f the first step that it, it's not waiting to get back to the way life was it, it really is just kind of accepting that that may not happen it's possible i mean it's, it's even possible that it may not happen ever so the ex if you can get to that acceptance i think that's one of the things that will could help with that stress or anxiety that that in the, in their context they talk about kind of reducing surge capacity but do you think you can get to that level of acceptance that might be life ongoing i think at this point i've accepted that it's probably into the end of next year. I don't know if I can accept beyond that, but th that's likely next year's problem. <laughs> <Right now. laughs> 
but what that does mean is we've had to make some pretty strong changes of our medium term plans. So be it as it may, we're moving on and we're putting in changes that we obviously never would have made if we didn't have these particular circumstances to deal with. But nevertheless, we are making these changes and hopefully it'll be in a direction that more aligns with where we want to be anyway. I think the, the next thing that they mentioned was, was expecting less from yourself. And this was one that I, I actually have been able to, to implement that instead of kind of spending the same amount of hours working that I was this time last year, really focused on growing my business. It was being comfortable with the idea that I'm spending half my time helping my children with schoolwork or other projects well, in part to make sure that while I'm focused on them, my wife can focus on work and vice versa, that there'll be times where I can work and my wife will take care of kids and there'll be times that she's focused on work and I'm taking care of kids. And I have noticed I can feel I'm working less and I, I've come to accept that, I, I think because I have kids and a dog and they're just incapable of being quiet for extended stretches. We've been spending a lot of time in the backyard while my wife is on meetings and I've been building a, a playhouse back there for them over the last several months. And they've been helping out. I've been teaching them how to use power tools and it's definitely something that would not have happened at least not nearly as quickly if we hadn't gone through COVID and quarantine, but it does feel like I am kind of replacing my normal desire for, pro for productivity instead of focusing on work and building a business that is much more isolated and singular with, within my household. I can't ask my kids to help me grow my business. I've been focused on productivity that does keep them involved and is for their benefit. But that just that idea of expecting less from yourself has, has helped a little bit. I was wondering, have, have you noticed that for yourself or have you once you learned about that, try to incorporate that? I think I have. With expecting less for myself, it's something, for better or worse, I've had to deal with a lot in my professional career. I think because for whatever reason, the timing worked out when I was an undergrad, it was right in the era of the dot-com boom. <laughs> so the year before I graduated, they were frankly handing out jobs with like keys to new cars for yeah. computer science majors. And I was a computer science major. So I figured, okay, so next year it's going to be pretty easy. <laughs> and boy, did things change after 2001, you know, after 9-11 and the, the bust and everything. And it was just one of those periods where, oh boy, now you're really in a situation where it's not going to be anywhere as easy as you might have anticipated. But, you know, I kind of rode that out and grew through it and I think maybe came out unscathed. <laughs> and I then decided to go to business school and things looked fine in, you know, 2008, 2007-ish when I was entering business yeah. school. So. <laughs> Right as I was about to graduate with a MBA in finance, um, whoops, <laughs> there, there's this great financial crisis that kind of hit us right at the perfect time. Uh, you need to let me know the next time you go to school and the field that you choose. <laughs> because it's like this combination of computer science, 
and graduating just as the tech bubble bursts. And then you get your MBA in finance just as, and graduate just as the financial crisis hits. It's like, if you had switched those, you actually might have been, I don't know if you've been better off, but if you had a finance undergrad, you might've been okay. But then like a computer engineering masters coming out of 2008, you probably would have been great. It's just, <laughs> yeah, you well, got some, it's the combination of timing and field that I find, I, I apologize, a little humorous. Yeah, I mean, good thing I didn't go into medicine last year. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> but, you know, not the best time to kind of get a business going and trying to ramp up. But it, it just relates what I always thought back to during this time is, well, I've kind of been around this block a few times now and just kind of wrote it out. And that, that's for frankly, what I had to do, just expect less. And I feel like this time it's been a lot less of a concern because I'm just in a better position in general, you know, just financially and whatnot. So I'm not that concerned and uh, it's been easier for me to just say, okay, well, you know, just double the timeline in terms of <laughs> a business plan. So it's something that I've had to do and I, I think I've done but it it also relates to the fact that you know I'm just also grateful that I'm I'm able to add that slack into the system without too much collateral damage. Yeah, I, and that is one area that I I do feel fortunate enough. I know other parents where both parents are still working, and they also have kids. And I think about it, it's one of those things that just makes me feel. I don't want to say it makes me feel better, but it, it helps me understand or acknowledge how fortunate my wife and I are that we can change our weekly schedule in a way that other parents can't. And I don't want to say it makes me feel better, but it does provide context that like, okay, maybe my situation isn't, isn't as worse as it could be. Isn't as bad as it could be. So are there any other things that you, you took from that article that we kind of the words of wisdom that you were either saw in yourself that you've been applying or that you think you could adapt? One of the things that stood out for me from the article is just the fact that you can look forward without having to fully acknowledge the present, meaning the present is there, there's all this bad stuff going on, but that doesn't mean we can't look towards a longer term goal and still try to line up whatever needs to be done to meet that. And again, that, that's part of what we have been trying to do. It's hard to say that it's a situation where it's not as stressful as it would have been, because it certainly is. I guess that's part of the acknowledgement part. But I think what I drew from the article is that I can still have comfort in knowing that there are things that I can do to keep me on a path where I won't regret the steps I had to take. And if, if that's the best that can come out of this, I, I kind of call that a win for myself. I like that. I, I like that it, it kind of goes back to the same thing we've talked about in the past of, of focusing on the decision-making process and I've had conversations with clients. It's actually, it's usually about like their company stock and should they sell or not. But by focusing on the decision-making process, you can avoid that regret that you made the wrong decision. I, I can see how that apply. I need to, I don't know if I've incorporated that quite, but I, I, 
I do think I could probably try and do that. I, I know for me, one of one of the other things I've been able to incorporate is, is I've actually been sleeping pretty well. So there's no commutes. Don't ha don't have to get the kids up as early. So I can set my alarms to head upstairs and set my alarm in the morning. And I, I do a pretty good job of getting at least eight hours of sleep every night. Uh, the other things that they recommend is the, the normal nutrition, exercise, etc. I have not been as good with those. Been okay, but not good. I've kind of mentioned this before in terms of my philosophy on getting all the ducks in a row that one wants to do kind of be healthy across the spectrum of, you know, social, mental, and, mm -hmm. and physical health. And for me, it's always, you know, a target that's a little bit higher up, but sometimes a few things need to give so that you can kind of make progress on some others. And sometimes it, it's just okay to say, all right, I'm, I'm going to eat junk food for a bit, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sleep well. Yeah. And you kind of add this all up and it's just one of those things where it's okay to climb up a mountain, but dip down in a valley, you know, now and then if you want to try to get to that peak. Yeah, that's good. I, I think, I think we talked about what the parenting was. It's similar to how I don't, judge any other parents for the decisions they're making to get through this time. I don't hold any other decisions against them. I, I think that everyone can kind of get through this however they need to. I've applied that to myself a little bit where in the past, what might've been a guilty pleasure, I, I, I feel less guilty about it that this might be like a kind of the self-care thing, but I don't necessarily do. Yeah. Again, I've been healthy enough. I haven't, I haven't gained weight during COVID, but I'm not necessarily, I've been exercising a little less. So I'm probably just a little less athletic than I have been in the past. But I don't feel guilty for some of those little things that might've been, Oh, no, you probably don't need this extra cookie. Probably don't need the extra beer. So, some, something like that. I have noticed I, I don't quite feel the same guilt. Yeah. I think slowing down and taking things at a more gradual pace and even being okay with being a bit depressed is I think acceptable during these times. And maybe that there's a reason why it should be just acceptable in general in life when things get rough. I, I have heard, for example, the, the reason just biologically, it might make sense to have people get depressed now and then is it just causes people to slow down and take time, you know, kind of like forcing the body to take time to process important things that kind of may get the short end of the stick. It's kind of like, you know, why when you're sick, do you end up getting all groggy and tired and sleepy and whatnot. Well, you kind of need that to, to recover and be stronger later. Mm. I like that analogy. I like that, that, yeah, the analogy of depression kind of forcing your mind to slow down and rest to figure things out similar to the body forcing yourself to rest and sleep so they can recover. I like that analogy. 
So instead of looking forward, not necessarily anything you're looking forward to per se, but what is something you'll think you will do either say today or tomorrow or something that you're going to make a decision with your well-being in mind? I think we're probably going to do one or two things like we did yesterday. We, we just decided to explore a new nature trail in the area. It's one of those things in the past, I lived in a city where it's quite possible. There were dozens and dozens of trails around that I just kind of overlooked. You don't really see them, but it's something I've gotten into over the last decade or so, where if we move to a new area, we just try to discover new paths or trails or walkways. And often it leads to breathtaking scenery that you just won't be able to see when you're taking your normal roads, but it's just, you know, a hundred feet to the left or right from a highway. It's, it's quite amazing what there is to discover with, with that. So we'll, we'll probably do a little bit of that. And I think we might just try to scout out a new restaurant here and there where in the past we kind of had our routine of, you know, we like this place, that place, and the other place. But now it's actually an opportunity to explore a bit more and try a place and then find an, a nice other location outdoors to eat. So it's the notion that, yeah, we can eat inside and have somebody serving us, but we can still have a nice meal and enjoy some good scenery. Yeah. Uh, I know we've been watching the Marvel, the MCU movies with the two older girls. If it's on a weekend, we might watch the whole movie. If it's a, some weekdays, we'll probably only watch half one night and half the other to make sure they get in bed on time. But that's something we've been enjoying. We've actually been sitting on the couch as a family, and once the youngest gets a little older, he'll join us. So we've been doing that, and I have fantasy football drafts coming up. I don't know if the season's going to finish, but I expect to get started. And so that at least that is something that feels normal, safe to do my fantasy football research inside. So I actually have a draft tonight. And tomorrow I am picking up the aluminum, the corrugated aluminum that's going to be the roof of the playhouse. That sounds like the most exciting thing ever. <laughs> I'm like almost giddy right now. <laughs> I can't wait to see it <laughs> virtually. <laughs> uh, it, it's one of those things where it's the, like it's, it's the process. It, it's like, okay, this is just the next step. This is the stage I'm at. This is the step I have. And I'm still far enough away from considering it a finished product, but I have enjoyed this process and this is the, the step I'm on. So I'll be working on the roof over the next few days. Sometimes it's only like 30 minutes per day or an hour per day. I, I have noticed there's been a few times I spend more time getting out all my tools and putting away my tools than actually like constructing or sawing or getting something done. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what I'll, I'll be doing a month from now, but I think that that's, that's what I'm doing today and tomorrow and the next day. Good stuff, Aaron. Well, thank you for the unofficial therapy session. It was, it was really nice just talking out loud and definitely wasn't, wasn't the happiest conversation, but also was not as hard as I thought it might be. I agree. It, I think just kind of verbalizing a lot of these thoughts that you and I are, are probably just sharing with ourselves internally is helpful. And hopefully it provides just some solace to not only ourselves, but others listening. So th thanks, Aaron. I, I appreciate the conversation today. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of the Mind Money Spectrum Podcast. 
be sure to visit mindmoneyspectrum.com to access the entire library of episodes. Remember, it's not black and white, but the wide spectrum of gray area where you get to pursue the freedoms you want in life. Opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance referenced is historical as no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested directly. Have a nice day.